friend and grab it. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to call to order the Good Harbor City Council study session of Thursday, November 17th, 2022. The time is 3.04 p.m. And I will do a roll call. Council Member Starset. Here. <laughs> and your kids too, amazing. Council Member Henderson. Here. Council Member Denson. Here. Council Member Wood. Here. And Council Member Barber is excused, and Council Member Rodenberg is excused, and Council Member Likens will be here shortly, and we will acknowledge her when she arrives. So um, I'd also like to welcome Andy Kapowitz, did I say that correct? Of course. And Chris Johansson, and they will be part of our agenda item four, talking about the HVAC alternatives, but welcome. Also welcome to our Chief of Police, Kelly Busey. And we have our parks manager, Jennifer, with us. And we have Carl DeSemus, our community development director, and city administrator, Katrina Knudsen, public works director, Jeff Langham. Thanks everybody for being here. And I'm sorry if I missed anybody. Um, and welcome to anyone in our audience this afternoon. Um, okay, so we'll go right into our first discussion item, our 2023 legislative agenda discussion. And welcome Gordon Thomas Honeywell Associates. Um, lobbyist Josh Weiss and Annika Vaughn. Thanks for being here with us. Thanks for having us. It's it's good to be here. So um, what I've done, uh, the document that's in your packets and that hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at, I did my very best to incorporate um, the direction and comments that you gave uh, last time to me. Um, we have two documents, the legislative agenda and then the policy document, which is um, the other policies that we'll be supporting or opposing as they come up. Um, and just by, I should say first, um, I do know there's a couple of formatting things I caught on the policy document. Um, so if you're distracted by that, just know that I'm aware of some of those things too, and we'll be cleaning up whatever's the final. Um, the main thing, I'm pretty confident that I got uh, the main categories uh, correct on the agenda and the policy document. I'm really, you know, want to make sure that this is worded correctly and expresses um, council's views on each of the topics. Um, and so let me just quickly go through on the agenda. So I did move the sports complex to the top um, because that really is, you know, one of our big requests. Again, I did do a little bit of editing around the verbiage, but the main point there really is that we're asking um, again, for the next phase being the pickleball courts and um, bocce ball courts, we also um, updated the cost, total cost yeah. estimate because of inflation. Um, and I'm going to run through this and then, um, you know, feel free to ask me, interrupt me if you have questions, but I'm just going to keep rolling until I hear somebody stop. I know we can talk about everything at the end or however this happens. Um, then the second is the climate resiliency study operating budget request for $250,000 and the narrative there is all brand new. So, you know, in particular, let's make sure that that's correct. Um, public safety was on our agenda last year, but I, I broke this out in a little bit different detail, calling out state versus Blake pursuits and then also training and resources. Um, um, Josh, before you move on, I just want to point out that Chief Busey has offered us language to um, put on the legislative agenda. The copy that's on the screen right now does not reflect those changes, but um, we can send you the updated uh, document. Great. Thank you. Amanda. Cool. Thank you. Um, the transportation uh, projects, uh, verbi main verbiage is, is the same. Um, the change there is the last bullet adding um, the westbound Wallachia on-ramp, and then I updated accordingly uh, the, the total cost, $2.28 million um, for those four projects now, rather than just the three. And um, Jeff and I have had some email correspondence about updating all of these numbers. Um, just want to make sure that, you know, at the end of the day, we have the final numbers. And then the last item there is actually the same language as last year about funding local culverts. So let me pause there on the legislative agenda before we talk about what's in the policy document. Does that work for you all? 
Sure. Any questions from council for Josh on this? Okay, everyone. I just have oh, one question you. there. Um, uh -huh. With the funding of local culverts, this is general, obviously, um, language. Do we have any idea about requesting money for any particular culvert projects coming up, like the one we're going to discuss later today? Or like an actual ask? Uh, or no? I thought we were going after a is a federal so grant going after a federal grant from the new monies that were I can't remember what the tagline of the new money is but um and Jeff's team has been working to bring forward a contract at the next council meeting for assistance in applying for that grant that's for the North Creek opening at daylight in here correct yes okay. but at the state level we have not put together a plan to go after any grant funding or asks for that project can they be mixed? Yeah, they, they can. Um, I'm not sure, Josh, maybe you know of uh, exactly where the pots of money could be that we could tap into. Well, there's been two things that we've seen. One is first, right, the Brian Abbott Fish Barrier Removal Board, which is a grant program. And so if we had something in that grant program, we could call that out and let our legislators know, you know that we have stuff in play. Uh, or projects in play. Um, the other is we've been successful and we do see other jurisdictions asking the state for specific capital budget funding for specific culverts. But, you know, as we talked about last time, um, we really don't have a project that's ready to go that has a potential need. Um, and I would see that as potentially competing with the sports complex request in the capital budget. It might be something next year once we have more definitive projects yeah. and dollars. It's more shovel ready. I think we'd be more successful then. Yeah. All right, thank you. I think sure. other than that, I think that was it, Josh, for that piece. Okay. All right. Um, on the policy document, whoops, I hit the wrong button. Sorry. Um, so this is pretty significantly revised from last year. Um, we do lead off with the finance section and talking about state shared revenues. There's really not much change in that section. Um, I then added a whole new section called housing and human services. And that's just my language. So if you'd like to go with something else, we can certainly create a different category. Um, we now have a proactive statement about housing and the need for recognizing um, the problems of housing affordability and homelessness. Um, I think this is particularly good. We'll get down to the local control language down below and the sort of uh, hand in glove goes together. Um, the behavioral health and substance use language is brand new and really does talk about, this is from direction you gave us, um, does talk about just really needing the state to continue and even invest more in behavioral health services, substance use treatment services. Um, it does talk about co-responder programs, diversion problems. This are, are programs, this does uh, similarly go hand in glove, I would say with our Blake language on the, on the front page of the document. The, uh, I also added a new section on environment and put climate change language in there. Um, and I kept this, I will say, I kept this pretty vague. Uh, I, you know, my plan is to be forwarding you uh, carbon reduction, climate change related legislation and be getting your feedback as you see the different categories that those come in and, and give me directions specifically on how you want to proceed on that. Um, let's see, infrastructure economic development is an existing category. Don't think there's any changes in infrastructure. The wastewater nutrient cap is um, the topic was there before, but we changed the content so that now we are basically saying we may need help with implementation costs with the new um, general permit. Um, business climate is a new topic um, and pretty general statement there about trying to align government programs and regulations with business needs and, and encouraging and fostering economic development. Uh, electric vehicle infrastructure is a new topic also, and that's also a pretty general statement just about you know, needing state funding for charging stations, both 
charging stations on city owned property, but also as well as help with electrification of city transportation, please. The main street topic, that language is the same. And then local control, uh, that is largely new language. That first sentence is pretty similar to what we had before, but then I added a sentence about not using local control as an ex excuse to get around difficult decisions, and then talked specifically about zoning mandates and um, you know opposing preempting local uh, control, particularly around density. Josh Decker, um, could you scroll down on the screen for us, please? Thank you. Sorry. So that's, that's our policy document. And again, this is, you know, this is gives us some guidance on which bills we're going to flag for you and gives us a little bit of jump start on where you want to be on these policy areas, but not necessarily something that we would proactively share with legislators as a document. Okay. Any questions for Josh on this one? Yeah, well, actually, friends? just on the whole thing. I actually like that you're keeping some of this <clears throat> somewhat general, that then you can come back to us when you see something or hear something and say, hey, this is out there. It looks like it might be this one. Or what do you guys think? Or just coming out flat out, we're against this. So I think this is a nice approach, gives us a little bit more understanding, a little bit more say. It doesn't make everything so negative that, yeah, we don't want this. So I like this. Thank you. Appreciate this, it. This also is really beneficial in working with Josh and Annika through um, the session, because as we know, once bills are introduced, it goes very, very quickly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so in us working with these two, they'll often call and say, hey, this was put in. What is this? You know, do we want to oppose, stay neutral or support? And having council policy where we already know how you feel about certain issues makes it very easy for us to then speak on behalf of the city and either support, oppose or stay neutral. This is more work for them, but I think it's more beneficial to because they've got yeah. to be coming to us more often, which is good. They like it. Yeah. yeah. Um, real quick, I want to acknowledge Councilor Likens has arrived. Um, any other questions for Josh on the posing and supporting? Okay. Thank you guys so much for your work on this. Really appreciate it and looking forward to hopefully a successful long session. <laughs> you guys get prepared. <laughs> Happy to do it. I'm glad it looks like we, you know, hit the mark on language. Sometimes I'm not quite sure if I'm capturing everything perfectly. So that's good. So let me just ask a process question. And I'm sorry if if everybody else except me knows this. Are we already scheduled to come in front of you for final adoption? Yes. Oh, I see it. There we go. Monday the 28th. Okay. I, I knew it was coming up. I didn't think it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so between now and then, it sounds like we'll be making some edits on the uh, first page uh, with the chief's uh, suggestions on the public safety section, but otherwise, we'll be bringing this in front of you for for final approval then. Thank you, Josh. And when you get that, if you wouldn't mind sending that to Josh Stecker, he's going to be putting together the council bill for this item. Absolutely. Yep, sounds good. Okay, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a happy Thanksgiving. You too. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Good to see you all. Good to see you as well. Great day. Um, okay, we will move on to item two, which is our housing needs assessment presentation. And this will come to us from our community development director, Carl Dupia. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Hello, council. Um, we have uh, a presentation from our um, our consultant, uh, Madalena Kalin, um, who will be hopefully coming up on screen here shortly. Oh, there she is, okay. Josh Bringer in now. And Robin Bolt, the grand senior planner, who's been sort of managing this project for us in attendance virtually. There she is. Welcome, Robin. Welcome, Madalena. Thank you. Madalena, you are muted. Okay, that should work now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'll let you go ahead and um, and take it away. Madeline. That's great. Thank you. Um, well, um, it's it's nice to um, to be here this afternoon. Thank you for uh, for having me. Um, I'm Madalena Kalin. I'm a senior economist with Community Attributes, 
and uh, we've been commissioned by the city of Gig Harbor to um, conduct a housing needs assessment. Um, so today I will provide a, a brief presentation on um, what, what this housing needs assessment entails, what to expect, what the process is, and kind of what the final um, outcome is, is going to look like. And, and then I'll um, leave it, um, I'll leave some time at the end for some, some questions and discussion. Um, I will share my screen here. Okay, um, is that visible to everyone? Yes. It is. We're seeing your notes slide. If that's been, it's fine. It's, I think it's fine for us, but it's up to you. Um, sorry, I, I can't hear very well. What was that? Oh, sorry. I just said the, the, the view that you're showing is your um, sort of your, your notes view. Shows the okay. next slide and your slide, which is which is fine if, if that's how you want it. Just letting you know. Sure. How's that? That's great. Thank you. Okay. okay. Excellent. All right. Um, so just a, a brief um, agenda for today's presentation. Um, I'll start with an introduction. So, kind of what what the context of this project is and. Um, a little bit about what the purpose of the HNA is and how that's going to inform the city's future uh, work um, on housing and the update for the comp plan. Um, then I'll go into a little more detail about our scope of work, so exactly what we're doing, um, and then um, just an outline of our schedule and deliverables, and then where we are at the moment and kind of next steps. So um, in 2021, the Washington legislature changed the way communities are required to plan for housing. And um, House Bill 2020 passed in 2021, amended the uh, Growth Management Act and instructs local governments to plan for and accommodate housing that's affordable to all income levels. Um, it also includes new requirements for comprehensive housing elements including an inventory and an analysis of projected housing needs for all economic segments. So that has spurred a lot of work um, across all jurisdictions. Um, our firm has been leading a few housing needs assessments um, across the region. I'm just wrapping up one for the city of Bellevue and I have other colleagues working on the city of Sammamish and Mercer Island. So we're all kind of trying to uh, get our head around these new uh, requirements and helping jurisdictions plan um, for the next 20 years or so. Um, so the, the city of Gig Harbor is also approaching a periodic update of its comprehensive plan in advance of, or it's kind of a first step of this update, um, the city's preparing a housing needs assessment and the housing needs assessment is, 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 is a required component of a housing element under um, GMA. Um, the housing needs assessment should include an inventory and an analysis of existing and projected housing needs that identify the number of housing units necessary to manage uh, growth that's projected for the future. Um, so the, the purpose of, of the housing needs assessment uh, will be to basically inform um, the, the future work that the city is doing as, as part of the housing element of the comprehensive plan. We'll provide some key data and analysis on the current housing inventory and the future um, housing needs for, for the city. Um, this assessment will help answer questions about availability of different housing types, uh, we'll look at who lives and who works in Gig Harbor, and then what range of housing is needed to 2044 for all income levels. We'll also identify recommendations to encourage more housing development and then help the city and its partners um, plan for additional housing over the next 20 years. 
So the HNA will provide the city with the tools and the tactics that are needed to achieve um, community housing objectives and to basically expand uh, housing opportunity for all residents um, and achieve um, that as an objective for, for the city. The um, HNA will be in alignment with the Department of Commerce guidance for developing a housing needs assessment that was released, um, I believe it's in 2021. Um, also, the Washington Administrative Code provides some guidance around completing a housing element. So our um, analysis will also make sure that um, it's it's in line with, with that guidance. And um, I, I won't go into the specifics and the details, but basically we'll make sure that we're, um, we're in, in alignment with both of those um, guidance documents. Um, for our scope of work, so um, our, our scope of work includes um, a housing inventory. So we'll be looking at characteristics of the housing stock, housing production, type, age, condition, vacancy rates, housing costs, and also affordability. All of these are important in determining the um, needs for the community. Uh, we'll also be looking at market conditions. And basically this section of the, of the housing needs assessment will detail the characteristics of the housing supply to help us identify how well the current housing stock meets the needs of current and future residents um, of the city. Then um, we'll be uh, looking at more specific data on community and uh, residents and workers. So uh, the purpose of, of a community profile is, is to describe Gig Harbor's population and households with a focus on characteristics that shape the uh, existing as well as the future needs for housing. Um, and it's not um, it's important to not only look at the needs of residents um, so the workforce profile will um, will be an analysis looking at uh, members who work inside uh, gig harbor but live outside of the jurisdiction so um, we'll make sure we cover both of those the gap analysis um, will evaluate the alignment between housing needs identified through the community profile and the housing inventory. Um, this is a, a critical step for identifying market se segments or categories of people with housing needs. Um, and we'll compare align with the work that the Department of Commerce is currently doing on uh, projected housing needs. So um, housing bill 2020 also required the, the Department of Commerce to uh, put out um, housing needs estimates, uh, projections for at the county level and the jurisdiction level. Um, it, it seems like their final numbers on that might come out um, at a at a good time for this project, so um, I think they're releasing them in in December, and uh, they're going to have additional guidance on how jurisdictions and counties will implement uh, these changes in January and February of next year. So um, we've been kind of grappling with how to um, how to meet the the um, basically how to align with some of these numbers and what, what it means for jurisdictions. But I think um, the housing needs assessment will use the data for the city to kind of derive a, um, a gap analysis that's specific to the city. And then we will take that and, and look at it against the, um, the numbers that are coming out from commerce and um, whatever the uh, the county is going to uh, put out as well. Madalena, we have a question from a council member. Are you willing to take both now, or would you rather we wait till the end of your presentation? No, I'm. Uh, I'm happy to take questions as we as we go along. Sure. 
Go ahead, Councilor. Um, hi, <clears throat> it's good, and I uh, like what you're doing. I get, you answered one of my questions of how you plan to capture the needs of people that work in Gig Harbor but don't live in Gig Harbor, service workers or maybe new nurses, firefighters that maybe can't afford some of the housing that we've got. Um, so it sounds like you'll be taking that into account somehow. Uh, my next question is, though, um, do you have plans to integrate potentially or to at least assess what sort of need there is for seniors who are, I guess we'll call it downsizing, empty nesters that are moving from their 3,000 square foot house with six bedrooms to maybe a 1,200 square foot house with two bedrooms, uh, but still want to stay in the city. I, when I ran and did a lot of doorbelling, um, that was one topic that would come up often about, I can't afford even to live in the city, but I've got this giant house that I don't need anymore. So okay, um, somehow you'll be looking at that as well. Yes, seniors um, is, is part of uh, what I think it's called in, in the guidance uh, populations with special needs. Um, so we'll be looking at that alongside uh, maybe the um, needs of, of um, homeless populations or um, other other populations that are defined as populations with uh, special needs. So um, we'll be looking at a segmentation of residents by age and, and, and then looking at all these other housing um, and household characteristics by age and, and looking at seniors as its own category. So, uh, yeah. And I have a question as well. Um, so the, the study that we're doing on people who work in the city, live outside of the city limits, what, what is the purpose of that study? Those numbers, since they don't live in the city limits, what, what is that about? Um, looking, so um, let me see if I heard this right. Um, looking at when we account for people that uh, work inside the city, but live outside the city. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, it, a housing needs assessment usually takes into account not just people that live within the city, but um, assumes that over time, people that are currently working here might also want to live within the city boundaries. Um, and uh, wh while there's, you know, housing analysis is, is complex because it's, um, it's dependent on um, a lot of variables. Um, people that we're going to be looking at commuting times and, and looking at how many people um, actually work and live outside. So kind of like commuting trends are, are usually help us inform whether the people that choose to that, that are currently living outside of the city choose to live there, not because they can't afford to live in, in Gig Harbor or because there's no um, houses in Gig Harbor that um, are in alignment with what they need. So that's um, that's the purpose of that analysis. Does that so those, those folks you're only looking at those folks if they work in the city limits and live outside the city limits. This is only pertaining to Gig Harbor, not to folks who live outside the city limits and work in another city. Um, no, no. I mean, there there is a um, assumption. So uh, for the city of, of Bellevue, we we actually looked at at three different categories. So the people that currently live in the city, the people that work in the city but live outside the city, and and people that don't work or don't live outside the city, they may choose to move into the city in the future because cities are expected to grow and attract people that neither live or work in the city at the moment. So there's. Um, not a standard methodology. Um, I think that you know we can discuss that uh, with the city as we set the methodology here. But I think of most importance right now is is residents and people who work in Gig Harbor. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Is there any analysis of environmental impact on things like commuting, um, availability of transit, etc., in the analysis that you do? Um, no, I will say this, this doesn't really include any environmental analysis. We will be looking at uh, commuting trends, as I said, and, and how people, uh, but it, it's mostly to inform uh, the gap analysis. Um, so no, I, we, 
there's no environmental analysis included. Great, thank you. I think something like that would be in our climate action plan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we're good for, with questions right for now. <laughs> Great, okay. Um, all right, so I think, um, I think I was um, talking about a recommendation. So we're we're going to uh, provide some recommendations, just kind of looking at what the data is telling us, and and um, and what the gap analysis and and inform some recommendations for increasing housing housing affordability and housing choices. Um, and um, we'll identify sources of funding for technical assistance for housing and other related programs. And then we'll bring it all together into a, um, a final report. In terms of schedule, this is um, kind of a high level schedule that shows um, our, our timeline. So the, the draft, the, the final report um, is due to the city um, at the in the second part of March. Um, we have a, a few interim milestones, um, so we're going to be working on the different pieces of the of the report and kind of working with the city to uh, to have those in hand so that they can provide feedback as we we move through these. Um, and we'll also be working on a methodology for the gap analysis um, in January. So hopefully we'll also have more information about, as I mentioned, the Department of Commerce and, and Pierce County numbers at that stage. So, um, the meetings on here, are they like for the, with the public or are they with the city council? There's quite a few meetings, which is nice. Yeah, there there are uh, standing meetings with with uh, Robin. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, we, we like to kind of keep in touch and have these biweekly meetings. I think we're, uh, we are scoped to do another presentation at the end. So that's, um, that's still to be determined. Uh, but I, our, our scope of work definitely includes a, a presentation of findings at the end. And how is this information gathered? Do you go to doors and talk to people? Are you relying on emails? Are you relying on snail mail? That's that's a great question. Uh, thank you. I should have um, I should have actually included that. So most of this will be based on data that's publicly available. So we'll use um, census data. Uh, we'll use employment data from um, PSRC, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We'll use OFM, um, and we're not. Uh, the, our, our this scope of work does not include any engagement. Um, we we might need to reach out uh, for special housing needs part of this, um, unless the city has specific data on that. But um, we're not. We're not doing um, anything like a survey or any public engagement, so it's it's all going to be based on uh, available um, data from public sources. Did I hear some part in here where again where we're talking about folks who live in the city and work folks who work in the city and live in the county that might want to move to the city, but how do we know that they might want to move? to the city? Well, how do we know why they don't live in the city? Right. Um, yeah, so usually we we look at, um, at at certain metrics that might indicate that. So we're, uh, for example, one would be we're looking at uh, the change in commuters by distance over time. Um, and usually that's a good indicator uh, of people who would like to live in a city, but uh, commuting are currently commuting longer distances. So if the proportion of people commuting, you know, more than 25, 50 miles um, is increasing over time, that could be an indicator that uh, there is a, a, a housing issue and, and cities um, are not addressing that properly. So we use the data that we have to, to try to inform those assumptions, but I, I will say it, it you are right, it's not perfect without um, actually having um, input. And there are a lot of people who like to have a big larger yard and larger property. That's not found in the city. 
So, so they may not want to move to the city. Yeah, that's right. As I said, I think we we just use the best data that we have available, um, and we use kind of indicators to to help inform these preferences. But w yeah, we don't. Um, we're not able to like make um, inferences about housing preferences um, like that, especially for uh, if somebody's living outside because they prefer a big yard. That's not going to be in the data. Um, okay, so we'll do our best with the data that we have available. Okay. If um if there's no more questions um my last slide is uh kind of work in progress where we are so we're currently working on the housing inventory piece um of the hna there'll be a general housing inventory included we'll look at housing market conditions and trends uh as i said we'll look at um housing for special needs populations and then we'll look, also look at affordability um and and cost burden so looking at the distribution of of the current distribution of households by income levels and then uh, to what extent um, different types of populations are are cost burdened at the moment this will help us answer things like what types of housing are available in gate harbor are there any groups of people who are not able to find housing and then what range of housing is needed over the next 20 years um, so this is a, a important piece of the analysis that will further inform the, the gap analysis. And that brings us to the end. Thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate you being here. Council, do you have any additional questions? Okay, I don't see any additional questions. Did you have, um, Carl, did you have any questions for um, no, I don't there. So thank you. Um, and if if, if uh, council, if there's any um, follow up questions that you have after after today, please feel free to reach out to me, of course, and have a conversation and get the answers that you're looking for. Great. Thank you again for being here and for presenting. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have thank a great you. day. Thank Goodbye. You. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Robin, for being here as well. Um, so we will move on to item three, which is the North Creek Culvert Replacement Alternatives Discussion. And this report comes from our Public Works Director, Jeff Langham. Thank you, Mayor. I want to introduce Steve Seville. He's our consultant with Parametrics. We've been working with us and stakeholders on this project. Um, so the study session that we have today is a follow-up from our January 27th study session uh, on the same topic. Um, we're all familiar with the location of this uh, of this culvert immediately upstream of our previous daylighting culvert on North Creek, aka Donkey Creek. The primary goal of this project is to remove the partial fish barrier that exists in North Creek at this location. Um, and it's been that that partial fish barrier is defined by DFW. It's not defined by us. We have certain criteria. Um, and then we had that conversation. We brought in some stakeholders at our January 27th discussion. Uh, and then from there, we were staff was asked to complete the feasibility study that was in the budget on alternatives of what we could do for replacing that partial fish bear with um, a fish, fully fish passable uh, culvert or bridge or other structure. So that's what's been completed today. Uh, Parametrics has brought together some stakeholders um, and we're going to, I'll list those out here in a minute, we, they've uh, identified some conceptual design alternatives uh, some of the permitting needs that uh, we're going to have to complete, uh, who's going to be involved, and what steps are going to need to occur, and then some costs estimates for the alternatives. Uh, when we brought together the stakeholders, we had a large list of people we wanted to include. That includes um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, 
uh, the Puyallup Tribe of Indians, the Nisqually Tribe of Indians, New Harbor Commercial Fishermen's Club, Peninsula Light Company, and we uh, reached out to Peach Sand Energy. They have not participated so far, but we will definitely keep them in the loop as we proceed. Uh, Wild Fish Conservancy, our, cons our uh, cultural resources consultant uh, out of Bainbridge Island, CRC, and the city's operations and utility staff. So it was a large group of stakeholders that we brought together, uh, including uh, planning division. Um, as part of the memo that was provided for you for this meeting, it included the two alternatives that uh, we've narrowed it down to. Uh, it includes the cost estimates uh, for those, um, and it includes um, a cost estimate for rerouting the wastewater treatment plant creek. So I'm going to hand it off to Steve. Uh, he can go over some of the processes that we've done in the project area and the alternatives uh, analysis. Um, and just keep in the back of your mind that at the end of this discussion, we will be asking council for uh, some direction, some consideration of preference of which alternative they'd be uh, wanting the city to proceed with. Uh, as you probably are very aware, in the 23-24 budget, we have design funding allocated for this culvert replacement project. And so the idea is from this meeting, we're going to uh, take that preferred alternative and move forward with design and permitting in the new year. Um, yeah, I'll just stop there. I have a quick question okay. for Langholm. With the, um, the groups that you brought together, Wild Fish Conservancy and the Tribe and the Fishermen, were they agreeable to both of these alternatives, all of those groups? Did you reach some consensus on that? Well, I think we'll get into that a little bit more, but um, generally, I think, uh, Steve, you can. You want to answer that actually? Sure. I think that um, most of the, the feedback that we received from the stakeholders was uh, derived around the benefit to fish, uh, what, how the stream would function ultimately uh, when that culvert is replaced, can be replaced. Uh, and there was a lot of concern about um, the integration of a pedestrian trail that could, could pass through there and how that would interact with the stream, making sure that it's not part of the flooding that it wouldn't disrupt the wildlife. Uh, that was the biggest concern that kind of came forward relative to the trail. Uh, and then there's a bit of a discussion around the existing uh, remote site utilization or the RSI, if you're familiar with the barrels that are out there in the creek and the relocation of those uh, to get them out of the floodplain. Um, but, you know, think about options of how that could um, continue to function going forward as an education component or a legacy. Uh, element. So those were the, the items that came up that were probably the largest. Uh, the, the culvert and the bridge uh, can both accommodate the stream. The culvert in its current size at 25 feet is not large enough to accommodate the trail very effectively. Um, so, but we, we also wanted to maintain it in a size that was reasonable for a culvert to give you an alternative uh, that, you know, showed that, that range of possibilities. So that was answering that question. I guess I could go back to how, how we got to where we are and how that proceeds. So we engaged in analysis of the stream first and followed the guidelines and required for fish passage projects in the state of Washington. Uh, so that's a geomorphic assessment, how that stream is functioning uh, or how it will function when the culvert is replaced with an appropriate size opening that allows the stream to function naturally. Uh, we look at that for potential future flood control requirements and how the stream functions with hydrology, the, the, the rate of flow and, and how precipitation responds to that over time, including um, climate change predictions out through 2080. That's the current uh, guidance. And so we fit all that in there. We figured out how big the opening would need to be uh, to accommodate uh, all of those things. And that's what size the bridge uh, and also the culvert to do those two things. And then we started to fit things together like the pedestrian trail, uh, potential future connection or, or future compatibility to be able to connect the Cushman Trail. Where would that trail need to be? That was a compelling uh, component of that. So those are the basic elements of what we looked at for the feasibility study. Obviously there's utilities in the road, um, we want to make sure that we can maintain all that. We have to maintain traffic during construction. All of those things are built into our cost estimate. 
Are there any questions about that? Um, I think what wasn't in the cost estimate though was to relocate the RSI, right? Because there are so many unknowns in there. Certainly, and I can let Jeff probably speak to that as well. What we did look to was um, how could a similar facility function in the future? And yeah. so we looked at trays, uh, what you would naturally, or probably if you've ever been in a hatchery, what that looks like now. A series of trays, they put eggs in it, and water trickles down. Uh, so being able to replace the RSIs with a tray system in a temporary facility that could be located potentially in the park and maybe somewhere up on the bank. But in its current location, it, it right now is influencing you know, the flow of the creek and it also uh, sits in the floodplain. If it's open to a bridge or a larger culvert, uh, it would be more at risk for damage from floods and it also is occupying a natural component of the floodplain where habitat would thrive and people get it out of the way. So in short, we didn't cost it because it's a lot of our money. I think we have some basic costs of you know what the facility would be for the same capacity of eggs that okay. are currently being done there. And um it, that also includes the removal of the tires that are there that are the retaining wall. Yeah. Okay. All of that would be built into the, the regrading okay. of the stream. Good. So there's a, a disconnect in the profile right now. Um, when you're, if you were to drop water coming down the stream and you go into the culvert, you drop off the end of the culvert. And, yeah. and so there's a disconnect. And we would, when we do these replacements, we grade the stream so that it's a consistent slope. It doesn't have any hydraulic problems when it's built. And we aim to get a slope or a gradient in the stream that is stable over time and fits uh, what the geomorphology is. So. There is a, a huge potential to do that. And, and part of that um, regrading of the floodplain would include the removal of all those current facilities associated with the RSI. So there's a sediment, the sediment treatment pond, and uh, kind of, I'll call it the levee or the burn that separates the RSI from the stream and the wooden. Um, and on the gradient, you probably want to, I mean, since you know what species are going to be using that, you want to match the gradient to what they would use. It's more so matching the stream morphology to what is stable so we don't cause erosion. Okay. Uh, and, and we would, when we replace the culvert, we would be reconnecting a section of the stream that's disconnected. So sediment will start to pour through. It'll again. try to balance out. It'll, it'll balance out. And it, it won't just be sand. It'll be sands and gravel. Yeah. And there's some cobble <clears> stream <throat> there. Very nice habitat. Stream and culvert. It is. So that will continue down. and. Right in front of the park is actually the upper limit of the tide. So that's a transition zone from the estuary. So which is better for the fish? For for the the travel of the fish. Oh, which which alternative? Which alternative? From a fish perspective, they're the same because yeah. we size the opening for the stream itself okay. in its natural state. So it's just it's just I mean I, I, for me. You know, I think that our citizens really enjoy Donkey Creek now behind the History Museum. They like being able to go under the, that road. And uh, I think that they really enjoy that. And uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing that it looks to me like there's about $500,000 difference in my... What I mean. Is that... I think I was... Uh, <laughs> Am I wrong about that? I mean, I well, uh, you might be just looking at the construction total construction cost. Yeah, you know, the total project cost was yeah one point two million dollars. Difference between Difference the two. Yeah. One point two. Yeah. So what, what do we get with both of them? Or are you going to go into this? Are we getting ahead of with questions here? Yeah. A little. Oh, I think it. Are you going to start tomorrow? <laughs> here we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah so. Any general questions before? Because I, I think at this point, yeah, we can just look at the <coughs> regular okay. alternatives. Sure. So I'll switch the screen here and just focus on the alternatives if you want to jump in when I, when I come up here. Sure. Whatever you need. Thank you. You can put a quarter in me and I'll just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually cheaper than you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You want me to speak to it? Yeah, okay. 
<laughs> All right, so uh, what's represented here is a plan view in the upper right corner, so that'd be looking straight down uh, from an aerial. And in the lower left is uh, kind of an angle view, an isometric view looking upstream through the opening uh, if it were constructed. And this would be the bridge alternative. So you could, in the lower left uh, kind of angle view there, you can see the pedestrian trail is that gray bar hugging the left side. It would go along the abutment, so it would look very similar to the bridge that's next to the museum, the downstream bridge that was in place a few years back, uh, and pretty much mimicking that design. So if you're trying to visualize it, it would look very similar to that. Uh, and then the creek, obviously, is in the lower right, and that would be flowing toward us and headed toward where you know the RSI facility is now. And that's where the depiction of that stops, basically. The green area would be the footprint of um, construction. So that would be everything that we would basically here, you're kind of digging up that, that entire hill slope to create the bridge opening. Um, you might know there's a lot of trees in there right now that are growing on the hill slope. All of those would be harvested and salvaged and used to create what we call uh, engineered log jams or large woody material structures that would be built into the stream that come to habitat. And it's very similar to what is found naturally upstream. So we, we mimic that through the new opening and the fish would utilize all those facilities. Well, we would replant many of the yeah. trees that are taken out. So it's not a, it's not gonna be a negative. Correct. And will there be sidewalks on both sides of that bridge? Like if someone was walking up Herberview? Correct. We, we did um, design it currently with sidewalks on both sides, and I think those sidewalks extend all the way down to the, the driveway to wastewater treatment plant. We may not be showing you, oh, but I think we're, we're trying to connect that whole thing through the limit of the project. So, um, on the, the path that we've got there, the pedestrian underneath the bridge, I see it circles and comes back up on the Harbor View. I know when I was on the Parks Commission, there, there was a lot of talk about when we get these properties, which we do have now, that this path would connect those rather than, because I, I'm not sure how interesting that is to come up and come back up on Harbor View Drive when it might be good to, at some point later on, we'd extend that path up the creek bed, or not the creek bed, but along the creek so that people have nice access to that. So it was, tell me a little bit more about looping around there like that. I, I know it's just a concept and it can always be changed, but. Certainly, so uh, we knew we wanted to show uh, the potential to create that pedestrian path. And, and at the time we didn't have, uh, you know, kind of a, a full plan of how we would continue straight up the hill and Got connect it. the Christian yeah. Trail. Yeah. So instead of having a trail from nowhere, we wrapped it around and, and tried to connect it to the sidewalk so that users on either side would be able to access the park coming off the sidewalk. Uh, but you're correct, there's there's already a pedestrian crossing in the area, and so yeah. that may not be a necessary thing. I'm not sure. And I think that once we move past today and we have some good direction on which alternative we're going to uh, proceed with, and also if, if we're going to connect the uh, unnamed tributary that goes along the south side of the wastewater treatment plant, if we do connect that, and that's this blue dotted line here, um, if that is aligned into North Creek as shown, um, then we can proceed on how this continuation of this path might continue on to yeah. what we call the Lions property of North Creek, Sam Harris <coughs> phase one. So that's what would that's what the future with this would offer us. Yes, and yes. It, it sets us up to do that. I mean, this project won't create the entire trail, but it will provide us that opportunity to right. continue. Yeah. Right, 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 yep. right. And I know there was some comment about the trail itself being too low and flood. So I, you just raised it just like we've done here with Harbor View. Correct. North Harbor View. Correct. We, we raise it, and I'm not 100% certain in the the lower picture if that elevation was fine-tuned, but yeah, at the hydraulic yeah. model, we right. keep it out of the 100-year yeah. flood. We keep it, uh, I think we're keeping it out of the, the projected 2080 100-year flood, so climate change is built into that. Okay. Uh, very, very extreme events that aren't anticipated could potentially flood it, but yeah. it would be well, but that pretty would be, minor. Just close it down. Right. You can't, you can't design for something that's so extreme. So it's good. 
Um, the, the culvert alternative, um, you have that one? Yeah, yeah, jump, jump, jump. Oh, yeah. okay. The culvert are, sorry, alternative is not showing a trail um, because culvert right now it's at 25 feet in width. So it accommodates the stream and all the habitat components we want to do. Um, technically, that counts as a bridge when you're inspecting bridges at you know, 25 feet, but it's on the, the smaller side and pretty manageable. But going larger than that to accommodate a trail, you start to get into almost bridge territory. And so it just drives the cost to back up to the bridge. So creating a culvert alternative with a trail didn't make any sense. It didn't provide any additional value or comparison from the comparison. Well, and just from an aesthetic point of view, walking along the culvert, but what's the length of that culvert there? I mean, kind of in general. Yeah, I think that one is, ends up being about 80 feet too. Yeah, it, I mean, it's just, I hate to say it, but it's creepy. And I don't think you're gonna, it's not an inviting thing to walk into a tunnel. Well, um, from well, a, we don't want people walking. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Although people will. Yeah. <laughs> from a habitat component, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> from a habitat component, you're thinking a bridge is actually better in the end than getting water. Right. Because it allows light. Exactly. Into the open, yeah. where culvert stays very low, so it's, yeah. Yeah, it's dark there. It is. And it has a similar level of disturbance. You still have to dig everything up to get the culvert installed. Uh, and then we, it, it actually creates a little bit of a, um, a challenge during construction because we would have to either store a pile of dirt somewhere to put it back over the top of the culvert if the, if the soil was adequate for backfilling. And if it were not, then we'd have to haul all that up and then bring structural backfill in and be suitable for placing on top of the culvert. Did we do geotech borings to assess soil types or is that a later? We haven't for this particular project. Oh, okay. we, did a, we did a high level assessment. Okay. So we brought our geotech in to take a look at what's going on in the area and give us some, some early guidance. To get to that was all filled material anyway, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah the road is yeah. Yeah. probably some of it. So in both of these alternatives, we have the rerouting of that creeks and the wastewater treatment plant. Is that something we need to do? And there's well, a purpose to that, right? Well, yes, that's what's going to be the next. I'm, I'm going to actually share a screen and then go back to the first alternative just to talk a little bit more about that um, rerouting the treatment plant creek. And it, there's a cost estimate for it. There's there's not a separate image for it. It's just included in these two alternatives. Uh, a key item to note though is that we essentially did or completed our 2012 uh, daylighting of Donkey Creek uh, without anticipating the rerouting of this treatment plant creek through and into Donkey Creek or Creek. Um, Parametrics did some hydraulic modeling and they verified that even if we reroute the creek, wastewater treatment plant creek into North Creek, and it goes through both the new bridge and the existing bridge, that it does have the capacity to handle those flows. So that's not an issue. Uh, but they did have to have conversations with DFW and others to talk about some constraints on the creek itself. So if you don't mind going into what some of those constraints are. Really. Sure. Um, so in general, I would say people are excited about the option to daylight uh, that section of the creek and it would pull it out of its current stormwater configuration that um, passes under Harbor View Drive and there's an overflow that goes under the uh, museum. So uh, getting that flow out of, the, out of those pipes and into the creek, everybody generally likes. It, it will be relatively steep. It's doable, but it'll be steep to move the creek over there. So it will have a steep gradient, and uh, there's still a strong desire to make it fish passable, which becomes a bit of a challenge. And there's not a lot of room uh, to maintain the facility for the wastewater treatment plant and the road. So we would be building walls on both sides. We can still fit the habitat requirement within those walls, but you would see a stream with vertical walls on either side holding the infrastructure up. Uh, and there's a lot of utilities in the driveway that we would need to miss. And there's, there's a lot to maneuver around and nobody is 100% on board with, yeah, that's gonna work great. 
There's a lot of negotiation and a lot of design requirement to do that. Where is where the vertical walls going to be? I'm sorry, Mr. They would they would have to. There would be a culvert where the red lines are. But yeah. The vertical yeah. walls would be continuing on from there to hold the Harborview Drive up and to hold um, things that aren't depicted on the drawing at the wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. So. It would be a little bit of a Disneyland scenario. There would be a stream, but it would have vertical walls maintaining everything. <laughs> 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 and so it's it's come to a point where it would be, and you can see in the cost estimates provided, um, about $5 million right now just to reroute the creek. Uh, and it has a lot of unknowns at this point about permitting because, as Steve was alluding, we don't know for sure. It, it's not going to meet all. We know it's not going to meet all of the fish passage requirements that DFW has uh, in place today. Um, and so we're going to have to work with the agencies, work with tribes to move forward with something that will could work. And even at that, how many feet of uh, habitat would we be opening up? Well, this is a whole lot of habitat we would be opening up by rerouting. No, it's it's. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's less than a half a mile. There's a, a couple of steep sections within the um, the topography that we have, the lidar topography, that we need to be verified. It very quickly runs into habitat that fish probably can't access. Um, you don't want to yeah, 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 it's too steep. Yeah. yeah. So let's see if my computer can catch up. It says my internet's unstable. So right about <laughs> here. Is about where it gets beyond the grade that is yeah. functional for habitat. And, mm -hmm. and for the species that are in the stream, obviously the, the chum are important and popular. Um, they're they're not very aggressive. It gets steep and stop. So no, but uh, we would be opening it up for the other species. Yeah, so the coho steep. and steelhead. Yeah. Uh, they could probably navigate it. Yeah. A little bit, but I, I mean, I don't have the two, the yeah. tobo on, but it gets really steep. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, just, clearly they're not going to have a mile or two of no, stream right. to, to go on, so it's right. And, and it, it's not a, it's not a river, it's a creek, so yeah. even when it gets really steep, there's not a lot of flow in there, and the fish wouldn't be able to, you know, they have to have a depth that's enough for their tail to actually push the water to swim, so right. it's not just the uh, the slope that becomes a barrier, it's the flow as well. And it's not a gigantic drainage. So. And what was the cost estimate? 4.5? Just under five. Yeah, it was 4.39, 4.49. Just for that. Just to reroute. Just for that. Yeah. If we're going to do this, I mean, should we, while we're looking at this, how much more would it be to connect, to have some sort of a natural path into the property that we just purchased? I'm sorry, can you, a, a natural path for what? For uh, pedestrians? pedestrians, yeah. Well, we have that in our budget separately under parks. So it would happen at the same time? No, it would likely happen separately. And and how much more would it be for it to happen at the same time? And why wouldn't we want to do it at the same time? I, would, it, I wouldn't want to do it at the same time because we're going after federal funds for this. And if we do it at the same time, we need to then make the trail federally funded. Okay. So I want to keep those completely separate. Okay. I just think that for our citizens to see that getting into this park, these natural areas, would be such a boon to them that they would really, really like it. And, and they would, uh, I think they would be a lot happier, I mean, you know, that they're going to be inconvenienced with the traffic, et cetera, to know that this is they're going to be able to continue from the history museum all the way up into this area. And um, so that's what I was considering. Well, and uh, I, I don't have the preliminary budget in front of me, so I don't recall the timing that was set out for the um, path that we're talking about. So it's, again, that, that path is designed permitting, I think is funded in the 23-24 budget. Um, it is very likely that we could try and keep the path, pedestrian path, on a similar timeline for construction. So it might not be under the same contract, but they would come together yeah. at a similar time frame. Um, and, and we could look at that. It's yeah. just that has to do with funding the construction of that path. Yeah. Um, I think I think that community would really be willing to be inconvenienced uh, 
to know that that would be part of the outcome. Sure. Well, and, and one thing to think about in, when it comes to the rerouting of the treatment plant creek is right now, I mean, the assumption has been when these renderings were created that this treatment plant creek would be rerouted into North Creek. Um, if it's not, uh, then this area here can more easily just be continued on to that separate construction project without having to build another bridge across the rerouted treatment plant. Right, right. And so it's, you can say something. Well, you keep making good points. Um, <laughs> so is one of the things that you're asking council, are we looking for their direction right now, whether or not we want to do wastewater treatment plant creek into North Creek? Is that a first decision? And then if they say yes, then we know it's more expensive to have a pedestrian path with an additional bridge over that creek versus if we uh -huh. don't flow it that way, then it would be cheaper. Uh, Correct. The cost estimate you have to reroute treatment plant creek does not account for the potential ex extension of pedestrian path over the rerouted creek. But yes, today we would like to know if there's general support to reroute the creek. And separately, is there general support for a bridge or a culvert? Oh. So two real questions today. Yeah. And then yeah. and then it sounds like if you choose not to route the treatment plant creek. Then, so the creek wouldn't be here, and then we could have. I don't know, well, we could. This but could go this way. We've without. got so many options now. The land we purchased yeah. north of there, we don't have to build the bridge across that very canyon like area of the creek. We could go across the creek and then connect to North Creek and up through. You know, we've got all those properties now to work with. This one is a, a tough one. Well, no matter where, we, if, if we, when we come across here, and maybe Council may have some misunderstanding your statement. When we when we come across under the bridge, if the bridge is the preferred alternative, and we were to continue, if we were to go onto the Lions property at all, mm -hmm. we would have to build a bridge somewhere to cross yeah, that. I agree. That's okay. what I'm thinking. Okay. But those should... are just pedestrian. Oh, they are. They're just. I mean, we're not talking yes. right. steel no, structure no. thing. But I think I agree. The, yeah. the uh, other 24 acres we have to the north of Lions property, there are many more established. Trails or not trails. There are more many more uh, areas that are conducive to creating moving creating into trails. Um, this would be much more expensive. Um, yeah, when the Lions was the only property we had, that was our only option. But now, if people just went under the creek and then over the creek, then there's a lot more options to get up to Cushman Trail without having to build a high bridge. Any any time you cross, if if there is a pedestrian path underneath the bridge here, mm -hmm. any option you have to continue pedestrians somewhere on the Cushman Trail will cause the need to have a large a a, a pedestrian, pedestrian bridge. bridge. Yeah, and the smallest pedestrian bridge would be to continue up to the south along the lines and then cross somewhere further west. Yes. So I wasn't really even thinking about going up to Christian Trail. I was just thinking to going along Burnham into that new property, to going along the North Creek uh, that the citizens could get to. Well, we're getting a little off, but I think it's somewhat related. So let me just zoom. Yeah, let me just zoom out a little bit. Um, and I don't have the wetlands on here because it can be overwhelming to look at all this, but I'm zooming way out so we can see where access points could be. So if, if we don't cross here and try and go across, this is the Lions property, if we don't try and go in this general direction, and instead we look up at the uh, other properties that we just recently purchased, the only way to get across these large wetlands and the creek is, to, is for pedestrians to walk all the way along Harborview Drive up to the existing access here across from the high and mm -hmm. and get into the properties here. Mm -hmm. So that's your only other path, which we are constructing sidewalks <laughs> up here, but there's a huge there's a large gap along the frontage of what is now or the Creek Salmon Heritage Site Phase Three. Right. Because the heritage plat never developed. So if we're looking at pedestrian paths, it's either where we're crossing here at North Creek with the pedestrian path going underneath the bridge, or pedestrians have to walk all the way up Harborview Drive to this area up here to enter those properties. And I know that there has been a lot of desire for a while 
to try and connect down, downtown Gig Harbor and this area of town, the North Harbor View Harbor View intersection with the Cushman Trail. So it, I, I have anticipated that somehow we would still, if we did have a pedestrian path underneath this bridge, we would cross. still cross somewhere yeah. along Lyons yeah. property and okay. probably connect onto the Shaw Warren properties somehow. So getting back to the diversion of the small creek, keep that, if you can zoom oh, in a little bit, because it gets back yeah, to the question I have about currently, um, We'll call it the unnamed creek goes into the storm drain and then exits out, I think, near the marina, right? It does. The, the path that's shown here is the yeah. overflow. It goes into a manhole, flows along Harbor View Drive, and then discharges down. Okay, so that's this color. Right? Um, if we take the, the do nothing alternative and we just leave it and say we're not going to do it because it is an expensive piece of work and it, it's not going to give us a great deal of new salmon habitat and you know i'm probably one of the biggest supporters of moving that creek but if we don't then the maintenance and or later replacement of that storm drain because that creek drops a lot of garbage in the storm drain which has to be cleared out i mean there's a lot of stuff it drops a lot of sediment in sediment in gravel yeah, yeah. yeah. such now, recruiting from up in the base so and that has to be cleaned out which yes. is an ongoing maintenance cost for the city which goes on at infinitum because the creek's going to be running for a long time. So there's a cost there of doing nothing, which means I got to clean it out again. It's going to cost so many dollars. I've got to do it every year, whatever it is. Is there some chance that we're going to have to replace that storm drain? I mean, I'd hate to say, no, let's not do anything. And then in three years, we come back and say, we got to replace the storm drain. It's going to be an $8.7 million project. Yes. I'm just looking ahead to make sure that we have enough information to say, yeah, it's expensive. We're getting a little something, but it may save us money later on. If not, okay. uh, so annual expenses to perform the maintenance, because what we have to do is, as Councilmember Henderson's alluding to, we have to make sure that the um, storm system, storm pipes are clear of large gravels and woody debris. Um, for the most part, we did a modification. There's a manhole, storm manhole right here. Yeah. We did a modification to the outlet of that manhole that restricts flows going into the storm system underneath the Harbor History mm -hmm. Museum. Um, that has forced water to go through the storm pipes that come to the southeast. That has, that forcing of that storm water in that direction has generally kept those pipes clear. It has enough velocity really high stormwater water velocity to flush itself out. Um, we do do maintenance on the Harbor History Museum's storm de detention system because it's gravel coming from our right of way in this area along the treatment plant that has been gone has gone into their storm system. That is not costing us an excessive amount of money. Uh, on an annual basis, it's probably in the $20,000 or less. So it's not a large amount. Um, my recommendation is uh, because it's not costing us a lot of money, we don't see something that's eminent failure. I can't ask Steve necessarily these questions because his counterpart, David Dean Kuhn, is the one who did a lot of the modeling for us here. And you probably aren't familiar with all that modeling that David did. But um, generally, it's not at such a capacity issue that we think that it needs to be addressed. In. It, this, this proposed rerouting would take care of an issue that we have but it's not something that's empty and that we should address immediately. Um, and so the recommendation at this point that I have is to proceed forward with, with not rerouting the creek and doing, if we decide at some point in the future to do that, it won't cost us a whole lot more money. We can make sure that we have the proper channel width, with which whichever option we choose, the bridge yeah. of the culvert. Uh, and we already know that we have sufficient capacity of the existing bridge. So rerouting it will just be the cost to connect it into North Creek and we can address that later. And maybe that's not for fish passage reasons or habitat creation reasons. Maybe it's strictly because we don't want to, it, it, we don't want to touch the storm system. Uh, we have been told by DFW because we asked, Oh, I'm sorry. 
So that's going to die out. Um, so we have been told by DFW. Uh, actually, Josh, I don't know if I can disconnect my screen now because I'm the one who's sharing the screen. Um, that they would not allow us. It is in my office, but it's buried. I'm sorry. <laughs> like how buried? Like underneath my desk, plugged in. Oh, yeah. in, in your little thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'd like to get the router. Um, <laughs> yeah. Maybe if we take a quick break after this. Okay. We can. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so DFW, when we look at the uh, Waste Art Tuma Plant Creek rerouting, uh, the, sorry, the Waste Art Tuma Plant Creek itself, um, the uh, DFW said we could not add additional grates in front of the culvert that goes into the manhole because we had to maintain fish passability even though there's no way we know fish can get up those culverts so um we if we touch those culverts and let's say we they're 30 inch or 36 inch culverts let's say we want to do a project that increases their size to 48 we're gonna to have to make that entirely fish passable is what i'm understanding so we either don't touch those at all or we have to essentially reroute it as we discussed. The alternative to make that fish passable from where it goes into a culvert next to the gourmet burger shop all the way down to where it discharges now across the West Station 3 would essentially mean all of that area would become a bridge or a massive culvert. Well, I'm in favor of the bridge and not rerouting. Yeah, the I, well. yeah. I apologize. I was going to go through the the um, put on the screen the actual total costs that were provided for each one, but hopefully you have seen them. I've got them here in front of you if you want to. And Jeff, just just bit. a minute. I Josh, did Councilmember Sorset drop off, or is he in the attendees section by chance? He has dropped off. He's not in the attendees. Okay. So we So we need to have a quorum. We have to have a quorum to continue the meeting. So if we can't, Josh, would you mind giving Councilmember Storset a call to see if he's planning on coming back on? I can still participate on Zoom. I can get on the phone. That we'd have to do that so we could take a break after after this have, and have you be able to be on zoom and then keep the quorum if council members source that cannot stay on or be on it's not I'll, ideal. I'll reach out to him and see if i can get him back on okay so in our packets we do have that information and did you all see that yeah. the class okay jeff noting that um, what council's just recommended. Is there an opportunity to look at what the cost would be to extend that trail over to the property that like council member was just talking about into our alliance property rather than the, having the sidewalk come back south, just go straight onto the alliance property as an access point? Yes, it would, it would just reduce the amount of sidewalk that we're installing. So it would be essentially be the, and then that's for the bridge option alternative only. It yeah. would just reduce some of the linear feet of sidewalk. So it would just yeah, remember some... that how it loops around and comes yeah. back and just straight and Yeah, it yeah. Would, and it would, but it wouldn't go very far beyond. Yeah, it would just get into yeah. the property. Yeah, it's, it's just very yeah. 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 far. But it would now eventually the sidewalk. Yeah, right. Right. it would not come on the east-west side of the right. It's a, but it wouldn't connect down to the sidewalk. No, you'd have to yeah. Yeah. You'd have to the only that. entry would be through Donkey Creek. Yeah, yeah, and I can, you know, I think that just looking from a parks perspective as well, there would be some additional walkway hardscape yeah. within Donkey Creek that could bring people that need um, access, an accessible route into Donkey Creek down into that area where right now they are not, uh, it's not accessible. So that has one of those, um, that fringe benefit as well. And then everyone who I mean, I think it makes more Donkey Creek more of a hub where now you know you can access all of these acres if you walk yeah. under this bridge. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I just, I know I'm not the decision maker, but I really support um, what Councilmember Wolf said. I, I mean, I, I do too. I feel to me to say this, but I think the extension of the Little Creek into North Creek is probably not at this point in time worth the money 
I'd rather see that money used to maybe start thinking about the Crescent Creek daylighting because that's a, that would be a better, perhaps a little bit more for um, more for the terrible English. It would give us a little bit more um, salmon <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So we aren't getting a whole lot here, and let's keep our fingers crossed that in three years we don't say we have to replace that storm drain, eight point seven million dollars. So, and the a bridge option, if we're going to spend the extra money, it's just so much better to, to get the that bridge to get the trail under it. It's just it fits into everything that we're doing here in the city, especially with the properties up there. So, yeah. and I want another quarter. So I, I get the sense that there, there's some clear direction there, and both about the bridge option and not rewriting through the plant creek. Right. Um, one thing we haven't talked about, and it's been intentional, is we have not talked about uh, very much detail about the RSIs. Um, we will take the RSIs into account as we proceed down the path into next year with the design and permitting. Um, there are a lot of challenges associated with those RSIs to remove them from the floodplain that's in the creek and move them somewhere else. Uh, there could be quite a bit of expense uh, on the city's behalf to relocate those. Um, and then we need to make sure that if we do make that expenditure, we need to have an agreement uh, with someone to continue to use those because we don't, we, we don't, in the, the conversations we have with stakeholders, we're not seeing that we have uh, a solid agreement that there will, those will be continue to be used. And we don't want to spend the money if they're not going to be used. Right. Yeah. Totally. And Ballpark money, so can you give an estimate? It's north of $100,000. It's six figures. Yeah. Is that something that we could bring back up? We've had more. Yes. Yeah. We need to have yeah. further conversations with regulators sure. about it and with sure. commercial fishing operators sure. and with others and talk about it. So you will hear more about the RSIs in the future after we get things we design. So are we obliged to move the RSIs? I know we're obliged to provide the water, they have no rights, but the actual setting them up again somewhere else. Are we, as the city of Gig Harbor, obliged? To do this, water I get. You have to provide water. We got water rights. Uh, that's a tough question. I don't want to answer okay. quite yet. We might have right. to talk to the city attorney about that. Her the link. So as soon as she joins, we can reconvene. Okay. Yeah. We so we look, we need to take a break right yeah. now, yeah. and then um, so we will take a break. Let's we'll say five minutes if we need to extend it to wait for council events and our council member starts up, and we will. But let's just say we'll come back at four thirty one. There you go. For now, and then if it needs to be longer, it'll be longer. Okay. And, they, and we can come back to this discussion after the break okay. to, to finish it okay. up. We just have to stop the meeting because we've lost our time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to the Good Cover City Council study session of Thursday, November 17th, 2022. The time is 4.36 p.m. And we are wrapping up our third agenda item. I just want to make sure that uh, Director Langhelm has the specific direction that he's looking for before we move on to the next item. I just wanted to appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. I wanted to just close out with two more quick items. Um, one is that we we talked about a little bit earlier, but staff is looking to um, apply for a federal grant for the North Creek project based on the direction we've heard today. Uh, the grant is due February 6th of next year. It's the Federal Highway Administration grant. Um, and as part of that, we are going to be, we have requested from Parametrics uh, a scope of work to provide grant support. And we are just finalizing those details now. And hopefully you will see that for your November 28th meeting uh, to have parametrics provide the grant support in time to submit the application by November or February. So this is a grant for construction or for design? This is a grant for construction. Okay. Yes. So it's gonna be a big one. It is. And uh, I've attended uh, Federal Highways Administration um, so a webinar about this grant application, and uh, they emphasized over and over that uh, shovel ready projects will be scored much higher than those that are not shovel ready. So uh, I looked at the criteria, I think Steve, you looked at the criteria. I think this project will, will rate very well. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
I mean, yeah, we should do it, but if we're going to apply for the grant in February, when would the grant be awarded? It wouldn't be awarded until 2024, I believe. Okay, so they would look and, at the time of award as to whether we had a shovel ready project. Yes. Yeah, so we won't have a shovel ready project in 23. No, but we by the time we, uh, well, in our timeline, we anticipate being ready for construction in 2025. And to them, that's, I mean, the, you, I think they're, they're talking about five, within five years of awarding a grant oh, to okay. have it completed. All right. And so we're going to be completed in 24, 20, or sorry, 25 to 26. And that's the same. Does the state uh, have similar thoughts about that? I mean, I know we said let's not look for state funding, but it, they, they can. Uh, we start looking for state funding. Yes. As well. This is a heavy lift for the city. And oh, it is. Thing we can get. Um, I think the uh, the federal ask we were going to fire this out, but I mean it's at least going to be two million dollar ask from the federal government, maybe three or maybe four. I don't know, um, but uh, the state funds include, as Josh Weish met, we mentioned, the Brian Abbott Fish Barrier Removal Board mm -hmm. program, uh, and then DFW said has told me in the past there's another one that they might be able to help us with. Okay, so good. all right, we will look at that as an option. So I think it's worth. Uh, continuing to keep an eye on. I don't know if Brian Abbott Fish Barrier uh, grants are they're accepting applications every year or every other year because they accepted in January of this year. Every other year. Every other year. Okay. So we won't be able to apply until right. 2024. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Good. Okay. So that's all I have. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So Steve, the sequel is just be more, more to come. How long before construction? This estimate. Everyone brings a shovel and <laughs> <laughs> it's ten thousand yards of material to use. <laughs> three wheelbarrows each. Yeah. I don't. I don't know the exact. Time to that, but it was sure. the building bridge decks halves, and so in the time that pure concrete were being set the above, it's probably six to twelve months, mm -hmm. depending on construction methods. And yeah, you can look at other construction, yeah. like precast stuff that you can bring out there. It's an eighty-five foot span. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's yeah. a relatively large, large bridge. And, and I mean, as, as we enter into design next year, yeah. we're going to be talking, having yeah. more details about what's going to, what we're going to have for impacts of traffic and how we can try and mitigate those because we all know yeah. that's yeah. not accepted to. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, for the sake of time, so Jeff, this is your next item. If we could maybe hold questions. Through the presentation, at least until the end, and then um, I love that it's conversational. But it we do have like twenty minutes left, so we can go over a, a little. But I want to try to be respectful of our guest time and be done at five. So um, if you could just hold your questions until after their presentation, that would be great. And then if we could go back to raising hands, so make sure we get everybody that wants to speak, and that would be great just for time's sake. So without further ado. Mr. Langholm again, Director Langholm. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Um, Josh, would you mind bringing over, uh, is it Marissa? Marissa. Marissa, right. and to the participants, that'd be great. Uh, so just a quick introduction, then I'm gonna hand off to McDonald Miller, uh, who's here to talk about the study. You've all received the memo with their report. Um, we did hire them in June to assess the alternatives for the, H the existing HVAC system in this building. Um, they're going to, McDonald Miller's going to provide some uh, summary of the report in a general direction, uh, and then I'm going to go just go through next steps when they complete their report. So, yeah. and Andy. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Jeff. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm Andy Kaplowitz. I'm the public sector account executive for McDonald Miller. Uh, we're a design build contractor uh, in the HVAC area, and we uh, specialize in energy optimization and uh, in, in um, sustainability. Um, I have a couple of my colleagues here with me. I'll start with uh, Chris, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, Chris Johansson. I'm a lead design engineer for our building performance group. Um, so this is this is right in our wheelhouse for building performance and, and making these buildings perform well, as well as uh, looking at sustainability. And that's Marissa's oversight job. So Marissa, there you go. I'll give it over to you. 
Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Marissa Zilkowski. I am our sust sustainable design manager. My in-laws live on Wolachet Bay, so <clears throat> I spend quite a bit of time in Gig Harbor. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you for having us here. What um, we thought we'd do, among other things, is um, in the spirit of saving time, um, it, has everybody who here had a chance to review the report? We'll we'll stick to the overview um, for that, just so that we give you know ample opportunity. The most important thing we want to do is answer your questions. Um, we've had a, a couple already, but uh, we wanted to make sure that we do that. So, in, dis in discussing the findings. Um, we uh, wanted to address all the deliverables that were listed in the proposal. Our consensus is that the systems are largely at the end of their useful life. Uh, we've considered proposed courses of action based on cost, operational efficiencies, environmental stewardship, climate resiliency, and a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we identified four courses of action, three of which are viable. Uh, now, you may have noticed, and I know the question came and asked, well, you've recommended three systems. Which do you really recommend? <laughs> The answer is that's your choice as a city council because we can't determine for you what what you place the greatest priority on. But we've shown you options that have um, that are cost effective. We've shown you options that are um, sustainable, and all, all three of the options would be would be great to go with. You, you know, there's a, a dashboard that we'll we'll touch on in here that we can um, we can show you really where where they're at. But in the executive summary, um, there are basically three different systems and I'll have I'll have uh, Chris give us uh, an overview of those if you have them. Absolutely. So um, we looked at really four different systems. The three that are viable are system A, uh, which is a centralized variable refrigerant flow heat pump system. Uh, the benefit of that is that it does both heating and cooling at the same time for multiple zones, um, which is a, a great benefit to a building such as this. You share the energy between the zones instead of creating New cooling, you can use cooling from one zone and, and it transfers to the other, and vice versa. With um, system B is an air source heat pump, which would provide uh, both heating and cooling again simultaneously from the same unit. Um, and that's piped through water, water distribution pipes throughout the building to what we would consider fan coils. And that's a, a very efficient system. It's probably the most recent technology. Um, it's what the city of Seattle and city of or Washington state are beginning to recommend as far as system design going forward. Um, its downside is, is certainly that it's the most cost. Um, so that is the system B and that's one of the reasons that we felt that it was well a very good fit for what your goals are sustainability wise. It may not be a good fit for, for budget and, and the long term the lift, I guess. Um, then system C uh, is a fluid cooler, which is using evaporative cooling outside to temper uh, cooling water and then sending that around the building through pipes uh, to water source heat pumps. Water source heat pumps would be a small version of an external heat pump that uh, produces cooling and can produce heating simultaneously through, or not simultaneously, but for each zone. And the, the simultaneous heating and cooling is shared through the loop that connects all of them. Uh, the fourth system that we looked at that we said wasn't viable was essentially a repurposing of your existing systems um, by replacing the internal components. Uh, the reason that this isn't viable is that by their very nature, multi joint units heat and cool at the same time, but you're using energy to do both. Um, it's not a it's not a shared energy system like the other three options are. It's a you get off, you get it all at once. So we felt like that would probably not meet your sustainability goals. Probably didn't meet your comfort goals. And uh, so therefore we, we scratched it right away, even though we felt like it was worth looking at from a price perspective. Right. Thank you. Um, so one of the things I wanted to draw your attention to is on page three of the um, of the report. And I have a couple of reports here if you don't have them with you. Okay, you're good. Okay. Um, on page three of the reports, we have a summary of, uh, from the executive summary of some information that's worth noting. At the very top, you see EUI, which is the Energy Usage Intensity Index. And that's basically a measure when you look at all the energy consumption of the building, regardless of how it's used, whether it's fossil fuel or electricity, um, it takes it and it and creates a score. And this relates back to the Clean Buildings Act, which was passed in 2019 and amended this last legislative session. 
the actual building, the building right now in its current state is performing at an 82.3 when it, the goal is for a 70 on the EUI score. And you can see by looking at systems A through C that all three do a very good job of bringing you well below the um, EUI score that's required. Um, and and I'll, I'll touch on that. Marissa, did you want to touch on some of the um, some of the sustainability aspects that we just, that we covered? Um, sure, yeah. And I'm happy to, <clears throat> sorry, I've got a frog in my throat. Um, I'm happy to share my screen if for the folks that aren't able to, folks that are calling in, would that be helpful? Um, sure. Okay. <laughs> I don't think we have anyone in attendees, but there is oh, okay. to watch the recording. It might be helpful. <clears throat> okay, so this is what we're talking about with the energy use intensity. <clears throat> so as Andy mentioned, um, our target for the clean buildings initiative would be 70. We're not held to that rule, although we do expect to be held to an EUI of 70 in the future in five or so years. So you can see all systems proposed perform well below 70. Um, on the subsequent pages in the report with the blue boxes, we've outlined um, potential considerations related to air quality, um, reducing impact on climate. Um, <clears throat> you can see the spike for system A, while in summary, system A is less expensive upfront, this bottom green line here on page three. You can see um, we did evaluate the life cycle analysis. So part of the climate change mitigation effort and sustainability review that we did is assessing the, you know, the overall materials cost over a 20 year lifespan. So keeping in mind that this cheaper upfront system, uh, the VRF, it would need a full replacement at the 12 to 13 year mark. Um, and then it would still remain um, fairly, um, uh, fairly affordable, um, knowing <clears throat> it's just something to think about from a material life cycle perspective. You're really looking at two um, whole house systems within 20 years. Um, so, you know, if we're conscious of reducing our impact on the landfill, um, refrigerant types, et cetera, that's something to consider. Um, as we know, our, our region, um, we're seeing a fire, a wildfire season. So we, we think it's important to call out the ability for all of these systems to, um, have good indoor air quality through wildfire season. All systems uh, provide good filtration for um, that stretch of time where we're seeing wildfire smoke. Um, uh, you, you're currently um, using something, a, a filtration rating called MERV 13, and all three systems would provide um, uh, that level of filtration. Um, one would have a double layer filtration system, a MERV 8, and then uh, another unit for a MERV 13 system. Um, we don't have to get into those details, Chris. I don't know if you want to hopefully explain that right or if you have anything to elaborate there. We feel that all systems um, can handle the wildfire smoke season. Yeah, thank you, Marissa. Um, I'm happy to address that for council if you have questions, but I think that I don't want to get into the new share if we don't it's not gonna make a difference to your selection. We did cover that in that minutia though with Jack and this year. Yes. So we're not minutia intolerant or <laughs> <laughs> I used to be in government affairs, so I love minutia. <laughs> um the, is there any questions from the council about what you've heard so far? So the build out at 12 years for the VRF system, I mean, that's a ways out. It could be less than that. It could be twice that. And it could be, we could find something even better at 12 years. And so that that's based on what we've got right now. This is based on assumptions today. Yeah. That's okay. exactly right. Um, there's constant change and evolution in, sure. in, in this field. There's a lot of technology that's come into play. 
you know, there's there's options that you can look at also that help to to mitigate things like pathogens to help to keep a, a, a healthier environment. And there's things like that that we can look at. But absolutely, in somewhere between your 12 and your 15, there'd be a, a full replacement, and you could always evaluate what the best options are at that course. I'll just interject here. Uh, so as council probably knows, in the preliminary 23-24 budget, we did allocate money to complete these up to, to complete upgrades for our HVAC system. Um, there is enough money in the budget currently to afford system A, but not system B or system C. Which is convenient because at the end of the day, we kind of think that system A is the way to go anyway. Mm -hmm from energy savings and CO2 emissions and a lot of other stuff. I yeah. mean, it, it's clear that it is, maybe not last as long, but again, 12 years, we're not gonna worry about that just because things are gonna change in 12 years. Things are gonna change, absolutely. Um, one thing to, to note in, about the cost estimates though, because this is really important to notice that this is what's called a rough order of magnitude, meaning that we haven't done the engineering work yet to give you a firm price, but the model that we base this on is an energy services performance contracting model, which means that at the end of the day, when we either arrive through the research at a price, we guarantee that price. So you don't have to worry about change orders and things to that effect. It's a price that you can guarantee. And we guarantee the savings up front that we find through incentives. And we also guarantee the energy uh, savings for you over the course of the project. And what Andy's describing is different than the way we typically do contracting, but we have already entered into an agreement a long time ago with Department of Enterprise Services to work with energy service companies. And so we that's one option we have and we've received, and we'll be looking at that as we get into the design permitting or design of this group. I have a question. Please. And it may be to minutia. But uh, from what I know of the structure, we have several units located around our building, some mm -hmm. over here, some in between this building and the police. Would the system that we're recommending, would that reduce the amount of those? And if it doesn't, would it reduce the noise emitted from them? So two parts of your question, and I'm, I'm glad that you asked, and I'm happy to cover anything that you want to cover, I just want to make it relevant. So if you have a question, don't, don't hesitate to ask. Um, with the system that we're recommending, the variable refrigerant flow system, we would put essentially uh, refrigerant coils in each one of those units or in each duct from those units. So each zone would continue to get a, its own heating or cooling and the fans would stay the same. We can look at replacing fans, um, but generally they're not gonna change the airflow or um, the noise emitted from them unless we look at like different styles of fan or different ways to mitigate that. But you're talking about the outdoor units, right? Yes. Okay, sorry, my apologies. The outdoor units, um, we would have to evaluate noise, but there would be groups of outdoor units um, and they would run as needed um, to supply the need of the space, right? They're, they're variable volume, so they, they increase or decrease as, as the space needs more heat or cooling. So, we can look at a comparison of the two. I don't have a, a direct answer for you. Okay, I, I would be curious to know if, if if something could be done regarding the noise of the units in particular, uh, because during the summer, especially when it's very hot outside um, or when it's very cold outside, the units are so loud that folks, um, even if with their windows closed, if they're on a Zoom call or something, the the noise can be disruptive to their work and. I know Jeff did this already, but uh, just for wanted to bring that up. Yes, yeah. that's a great point. Um, we can look at things like compressor buckets. We can look at things um, that have to do with how the fans are made and the design of the fans to help eliminate some of that noise. Um, that would be very helpful for the staff that are frustrated by it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, yes, thank you. Um, we have uh, on the second floor some issues. <laughs> with yeah. with comfort for yes. our staff up yes, on the second floor, and does does this take into consideration a, a plan to help uh, help the mayor's office <laughs> and help everybody else up on the second floor? Yes, the, the design is intended to eliminate the need for space heaters and to not worry about too hot, too cold. It's it's designed to to provide a much higher level of quality of comfort for your 
years. So back. my office would no longer control everyone on. No, I'm afraid. So. I'm sorry. Oh, I know so the power is <laughs> <laughs> the power is intoxicating. Because I think no, I don't want that power. I, I, so that would be great if that was not yeah. in my power. That would be amazing. Good. That would be phenomenal. Good. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's important. That's important. Yeah. For I mean, it, it's it's just bizarre. So anything will be an improvement. There, there'd be new controls. So yeah, building control adjustment makes a big difference in that. Yeah. Uh, rerouting zones so that they're grouped in strategic ways Great. makes a difference, and we can look at all of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Annie and his team for doing this and making it so clear and easy to understand, even though we're talking freons and things like that. And I really appreciate the fact that you've taken to heart the council general direction about climate change and reducing the need. I mean, it would have been easy to have said, hey, we'll put in some bigger gas-fired burners in here and we'll you know do this and that. But I, I think this is good. I think this is a huge step in the right direction. And Pleased to see it. Thank you, Council Member. I need to sleep at night as well. So this is something <laughs> very important to me too. That's a big reason why I'm here. Absolutely. So Jeff, are you looking? Yeah, are you looking well, for like that? Yeah, just of... looking for general direction to see if there's support. Their staff recommendation is to proceed with uh, all the system A, but uh, just because it's within budget. Um, but if that's what we're looking for, you could agree with that recommendation or if they go a different direction because we will want to turn around quickly in the new year and uh, either enter into an energy service contract with them or enter into a design um, design contract with them. Are there grants we can look at for this? I you know the state is talking to any building. We can look at that. There have been in the past. I don't know if there are any. Okay. Yeah, it seems to be good. I, I, and I'm, I'm, I support A, I just, uh, I'm usually someone who says let's not buy the cheapest, let's not buy the most expensive, let's go the middle of the road. We're going to have, we know we're going to have to look at this again in 12 years. So, but I also sort of going to go with this because we recommend it, but it, it is a concern that 12 years will go past. Very fast. There, there are cheaper alternatives. We just didn't consider them because they didn't eliminate the natural gas burners, and uh, mm -hmm. they were not the efficiencies just were not there. There are other cheaper alternatives. This would be, in my opinion, the middle of the road selection. Even though from the three that are presented, that are all recommended, it is I, the lowest cost out of those three. But there are cheaper alternatives. We just didn't. Yeah. Couldn't recommend it. That's, okay. that's a really good point that, that Jeff's making. That we we really looked at this from the standpoint of being stewards of the environment as well. So while it looks like it's the low option, it's really not lowest on the rung. Okay. It's just the okay. best fit suited to your budget and your your climate objectives as well. Right. Thank you very much. Can you chat it with your maintenance folks to make sure they're okay with maintaining the system? Yes. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, it was there is a preference to not maintain. They did not want to maintain the system. system. Right, the water source. Water source. Yeah. That okay. comes with, in their experience, a whole host of other maintenance issues that it just didn't, didn't want to deal with. Easy selection. Yeah, question. Um, the energy codes, Washington State energy codes, are, are they're, they're changing this, this next year. Yes. I believe, right, those will be adopted, and I assume the system is all. Oh, absolutely. Standards, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, energy code switches in as of July. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 So some of the other options that maybe you're talking about, Jeff, they may they, they may not they likely don't meet those codes, even though right. they're cheaper. Unless you marry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you would likely not be able to meet all those things. Yeah. 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 Okay. We like I just have a quick comment. So I noticed on the end of page seven, there's additional opportunities. Um, yes. Things like the lighting, um, the water, the tree canopy, the solar. That seems like a well-made list for not having a sustainability action. Yeah. Uh, committee. I was just, you know, there's all kinds of things that they're recommending. I noticed it was interesting. It says fire protection, bring up to code requirements. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a longer discussion about fire protection. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just saw that it went on that full. All right. Okay. Unintended. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, oh, good one. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Okay, great. Well, I think we have consensus for yeah. option A. Yeah. Robin, do you agree with, with option A or did you have any comments? I wanted to give you an opportunity to comment. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm okay with option A. I'm not super excited about having to look at replacement in 12 or 13 years, but if we've run the numbers and I know, you know, the budget is is tight um, for the next couple of years. So I'm, I'm all right with that if that's what staff thinks is best. Great. Okay. Thank you again to all three of you for being here with us today and giving such a great Mm -hmm. easy to read, easy to understand presentation. Really appreciate it. And Jeff, for all your work on this as well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, if there is nothing else for the good of the order, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> the meeting adjourned. Yay. All three of you. <laughs> <laughs>